Warning, this podcast contains themes of extreme violence and murder. Subject matter may be offensive to some listeners. Discretion advised. Welcome to another episode of Evil Transgression, your homicide headquarters here in podcasting. I'm Josh, and with me as always, Dustin and Rex. Hey, what's up? What's going on? You are super excited about that. (laughs) (laughs) Let me guess, you have a good one for us today. No, it's lousy. Turn this off. If you're listening, (laughs) turn it off. (laughs) Kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. Uh, I would like to invite all of you NASCAR watching, cigarette smoking, long haired Dale Earnhardt fans to turn it up a little bit because we're going to talk a one of your own. Dale Earnhardt forever. <laughs> one of your own. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh. No, we, uh, the story today, um, we're going to talk about the murder of Kerry Culberson. And. The killer is believed to have been her piece of trash boyfriend, Mm. Vincent Doan. And that's where I come up with it. I I just pictured him like shirtless. Are we we going to post a picture of this guy? Oh, yeah. But I just picture him shirtless, smoking Marlboros and cussing at his wife. Well, his girlfriend, uh, Watch, trying to watch the NASCAR race. I mean, nothing against anybody that watches NASCAR. <laughs> yeah. But that's what I pictured. Hey. You might too when you see this picture. Uh, when we moved, well, when we came and looked at the house, the previous owner was huge on Dale Earnhardt and Jr. I mean, they had posters all in the garage. They had one of the bedrooms <laughs> was decked out with NASCAR stuff. Obviously, it's it's not there now, but well, I mean, th- that's one thing you can say about Dale Earnhardt fans is. When they, They're when dedicated. You're, yeah. When you're a Dale Earnhardt fan, buddy, you are a Dale Earn- Earnhardt for life. Yeah. Like, you Dale don't talk Earnhardt bad about Dale. Forever. <laughs> you better watch your mouth talking about number three. <laughs> <laughs> Come over there and smack that marble out your lips. <laughs> Dude, you're about to get so much hate. For <laughs> and I'm going to love it. Uh, yes. Remember, that's Josh talking, not yes. me or Rex. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. I love you guys. I do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I do love you. I'm just not a NASCAR guy. No. But I don't have really a whole lot to say about it. I mean, I'm just, I just pictured this guy. I used, being to, that I used to watch NASCAR when I used to bet on it. But I don't bet on it no more. Right, who so. would bet on something as tough to bet on as NASCAR? I mean, anything can happen. It was fun. I won a couple times. Lost more than I won, though. The, you know what they ought to do with NASCAR? Is to take it back to uh, like the good old days. Where it's just like, hey, you got to have a stock car. And just whoever whoever drives the best. Yeah. I mean, that, Richard Like Petty. the Moonshiners. No, I'm talking before Petty. I'm talking Ooh, the Moonshiners. When it all started. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. And now we're talking. Right. I mean, I don't watch it, but I like to do the Na- uh, NASCAR go kart racing. That's kind of fun. Yeah. Down south. Yep. It is. I can hardly I fit in there it. There would be NASCAR go karts down south. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I struggle to even get in one of those things, you know, because of the height. You're it's like six, seven. I wish, six, four. I know, I was just giving you an extra couple oh, inches. Thanks. Josh is like, what, 5'4", five, 5'5"? Five, five. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm <laughs> close to six foot. No, you're not. <laughs> close. <laughs> Seven more inches to go. <laughs> I'm like 5'8". <five>, oh. <laughs> but when I wear boots, I'm a little taller. <laughs> okay. Now that we've talked about nothing that pertains to this story, uh, let's let's dive in. We're let's gonna we're it. gonna talk about Carrie Culberson, the murder of Carrie Culberson. So All buckle right. up, evil mob, as we discuss the murder of Carrie Culberson. 
Carrie Culberson was born on January 31st, 1974, to Deborah and Roger Culberson. Carrie was the first of two children. Carrie was very close to her younger sister, Christina. Culberson grew up in Blanchester, Ohio, a small rural town about 30 miles northeast of Cincinnati. Carrie Culberson was an active and popular young lady who was a cheerleader, a member of her school track team, and was on her high school homecoming court. After graduating high school, Carrie attended community college in Cincinnati. She moved to Midland, Ohio with a friend, which was the neighboring town of Lanchester. It was around this time that Carrie Culberson met Vincent Doan, and the two began dating. Carrie left community college to become a nail technician at two different salons in order to save money and attend nursing school in the future. So she's got she's got plans. Oh yeah. Good plans. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been to Cincinnati probably a thousand times and I've never heard of this city. Blanchester? Never. It's a uh, it's rural. It's r- rural. Hmm. I rural. mean is it uh is it off 71? I don't know, let's take a road trip. Let's do it. <laughs> then we'll hit up uh, Kings Island. Sure, why not? And Gold Star Chili. Oh, uh, and Skyline. Skyline. Oh, or is that the? Do they still have Gold Star? Yeah, Gold Star is huge in Cincinnati. Are you sure they didn't change it to Skyline? No, they're they're two totally different places. Two totally different. But tastes tastes. exactly the same. They don't. Mm. They don't. Skyline has more of like brown sugar taste, or Gold Star does not. Gold Star is better. I just want one of those five ways. Mm. Bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back on track. Back on track. Uh, so Carrie would move back home to live with her mother, Deborah, who was now divorced from Carrie's father, Roger, and Carrie's sister, Christina. So she's moving back home to work at these salons to save money to go to nursing school. You know, she's doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Carrie Culberson's relationship with Vincent Doan was a violent mess. In the three years they had been dating, Doan was known to have been very physically and mentally abusive to Carrie. Now, this Vincent Doan guy is a real piece of work, and I say that in my most PG-rated way I can. Doan was known to lay hands on Carberson quite often, leaving her with black eyes and busted lips several times. He would beat her whenever he caught her talking to any of her friends that were actually males, or sometimes just when something set him off. Like, I believe there's a story where uh, they were going somewhere and his truck ran out of gas, so he gets pissed off and beats on her. Well, what a loser. Yeah. I mean, it's your fault, idiot. Put gas in the right. vehicle. Yeah. But he would also call her work at least five times a day. What, to make sure she was there? or Yeah. I mean, that's 100% mental... This dude's psycho. Abusiveness. Oh, yeah. yeah. Culberson had called the police on Vincent Doan several times. Once when Doan smashed her car windows while she sat inside the vehicle, and also when he hit her in the stomach bruising her kidneys in 1995 and again in 1996. Mm. Jesus, how hard did he hit her? You got to punch her pretty good yeah, pretty to bruise hard. her kidneys. Yeah, pretty hard. Yeah. Carrie filed a criminal complaint of misdemeanor assault against Doan in the summer of 1996 after he hit her on the head with a space heater, requiring Carrie to receive five staples to close the gash on her head. Jeez. Mm. The two were scheduled to appear at a court hearing in early September 1996 regarding the incident. So we're finally going to get somewhere, right? On August 25th, 1996, Vincent Doan abducted Carrie Culberson at gunpoint and held her for five hours and then eventually convinced her to drive him home. So he basically kidnapped her with a, mm-hmm. at gunpoint and five hours he kept her. And then he's like, hey, take me home. Are we about to have another uh, failure of the Ohio judicial system? Oh, you're going to have a failure of something coming oh, up. Oh, great. Three days later, on August 28th, 1996, Carrie Culberson disappeared. Now, here's what we know. Carrie Culberson had attended a volleyball game with two of her friends on the evening of August 28th. 
Vincent Doan shows up at the volleyball game and argues with Carrie Culberson. After the volleyball game, Carrie and her friends stop at the Rolling Hills Bar in Marathon, Ohio, where Doan again stops in and argues with Carrie. He tries to get Carrie to leave with him, but she says she can't because she's the designated driver, which really she's just not wanting to be alone with him. I mean, can you blame her? Right. I mean, we're getting ready to go to court because you smacked me on the head with a space heater. Why would I want to go with you? Right. Vincent Doan gets mad and leaves the bar, squealing his tires as he pulled out from the parking lot. So he's making, he's making a scene. Oh, tough guy. After leaving the bar, Carrie asks her friend to drive by Vincent Doan's home before dropping off their other friends, and again before her friend dropped her off at home. So they go by Vincent's house twice. Both times, Doan's black Mustang was in his driveway. Carrie Culberson was dropped off at her home around 11.30 p.m. Carrie's home was only three blocks away from Vincent Doan's house. That means the car in his driveway isn't necessarily needed for him to get to Carrie's house. He could easily walk that. Yeah. Right? So Carrie's home at 11.30. Shortly after she arrived home, uh, around 11.40 p.m., a neighbor witnesses Carrie's red Honda CRX pull out of the driveway without its headlights on. The car lights were then turned on after driving up the road a short distance. It's quite odd. Yeah. You know, is that somebody's way of trying to sneak away or what? You know, Carrie's 22 at this time, and she didn't have a curfew, so why would she need to sneak out to go anywhere? I mean, I I know she lives with her mom and her sister, but she's 22, and she's not like, Mom, I'm leaving. I do that sometimes. I'll drive away from the curb, and I'll, like, wait and then turn my lights on. I don't know why, but I do. That's because you're weird. Yeah. Yeah. Just saying, well, I mean, this is just odd at this time. Right, right. I mean, it's, a, it's a weird thing. So at 1230 a.m., which is now August 29th, 1996, a neighbor of Vincent Doan named Billy Joe Brown is getting ready to lay down in her bed for the night when she hears some commotion outside. Brown looks out the window to see Doan chasing a woman who is screaming for help from his residence into her yard and hears Doan say, quote, I told you the next time I was going to kill you. Ooh. A red Honda CRX is in the driveway in front of Doan's house. Brown, who doesn't have a phone in her house. What? Goes to wake her husband up as she thinks it's just another drunken dispute at the Doan residence. Yeah, I don't know who doesn't have a phone in their house in 1996. Eh, I don't know. Mm, yeah. So by the time the couple make it outside, Doan and the woman, who we can safely assume was Carrie Culberson, are nowhere to be found, nor is the Honda CRX. At 1 o'clock a.m., Vincent Doan knocks on the window of Jeff and Jennifer Warren, who were friends of Doan, Doan claimed he had run out of gas and needed to use their phone. Vincent Doan allegedly made a phone call to his father, Lawrence Baker, and then left the home on foot. At 3.15 a.m., Vincent Doan arrives at Tracy Baker's home, his half-brother. Tracy Baker's wife, Lori Baker, and her friend, Vicki Watkins, both witness Doan arriving in just a pair of jeans, dirty, with what appeared to be blood smeared on his bare chest. Hmm. Doan takes a shower, and he and Tracy Baker leave the house around 4.30 a.m. with garbage bags and a gun. That's not odd. Oh, uh, right? yeah. According to Lori Baker, Vincent Doan and Tracy Baker were back at the house by 5.50 a.m. Lori gave Tracy some bleach and a scrub brush that he took to Doan, who was again showering. Lori testified that there was blood on Tracy's clothes and that she saw him wipe off some blood from his boots. However, later on, the blood samples taken from Tracy's boots or his truck or a towel were too degraded for testing. Hmm. We'll get to the shoddy police work in a bit. Great. By 6 a.m., Deborah Culberson, Carrie's mother, wakes up to find that her daughter and her car are gone. It wasn't like Carrie not to be home, so she knew something wasn't right. You know, 
Carrie not being home and not letting her know she wasn't going to be home, that's a red flag. Mm -hmm. Deborah Culberson and Carrie's sister, Christina, drove around town looking for her along with Carrie's father, Roger, and two of the friends she had been with the night before. So they have their own little search party. Authorities were notified that Carrie Culberson was missing. When Deborah Culberson confronted Vincent Doan about Carrie's disappearance, he gave three different stories. One story was that he hadn't seen Carrie for three days, then she had come over to his house around 12.30 and was honking the horn, but uh, he could tell she was drunk, so he shut the door and ignored her until she left, and the other story was that she had come over and came inside where he told Carrie he didn't love her anymore and she just got mad and left. So there's your three stories. I ain't seen her in three days. Well, that one's blown out of the water because the friends saw you at the freaking volleyball game. Right. Well, and uh, somebody's seen you chasing her around the yard. Yeah. So the she came over to my house at 1230, was honking the horn, but I didn't come out and she left. Well, she's honking the horn. I'm sure everybody would have known. Yeah. Right. And then her coming in and him saying, well, I don't love you anymore. Well, buddy, guess what? I don't think she loves you anymore. Right. I mean, they're going to court. You're the one that's chasing her all around town. You're the one that's, you know, calling her work five times a day. I don't think that's the story either. Now, this is where the uh, shoddy police work comes in. Clearly, Vincent Doan is suspect number one. Five days later, investigators began searching the Doan family property in Blanchester. The problem is that the police chief, Richard Payton, was a friend of Doan's family and warned them that Vincent was bound to become the prime suspect in the case. Payton allowed the Doan family's property to be left unattended overnight during the search for evidence. The following morning, footprints were discovered on the banks of a drained pond on the property. It is believed that Doan and possibly several of his family members removed Culberson's body from the pond during the evening hours when the site was not secured. Nine days after her disappearance, 300 volunteers spent the weekend searching for Carrie in the woods, fields, and abandoned buildings around the town. Wow. The family offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of anyone responsible for Carrie's disappearance. Carrie's disappearance was even covered on television on Inside Edition and Oprah. Hmm. Dang. It was big. I mean, it's a big deal. Yeah. Still, no sign of Carrie's body nor the red Honda CRX was found because of that. Finally, in March of 1997, authorities decided to finally arrest Vincent Doan and charge him for the kidnapping of Carrie Culberson. The kidnapping. With the history of violence and him claiming to have been the last person to see her, he was responsible for her disappearance. So, I mean, it's for the original arrest is for kidnapping. But not something to hold him on. Wow. Right. Yeah. Now, in June of 1997, two counts of aggravated murder were added to Doan's charges. The problem with the case was the lack of physical evidence to charge Vincent. No so body either. That, that's the thing. That's why you don't have a premeditated murder or a, you know, first degree murder charge. Mm-hmm. An aggravated murder. Now, well, does not aggravated murder in the state of Ohio carry the death penalty? It uh, can. It can. Yeah. The problem with the case, like I said, is you don't have a body and you don't have the evidence needed to basically nail this down. So you're taking a shot here. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the way it looks, the guy's pretty guilty. Oh, yeah. Uh, either way, the trial began July 21st, 1997 at the Clinton County Courthouse in Wilmington, Ohio. The prosecution presented two separate theories on what had happened. One theory was that Doan was obsessed with Carrie Culberson, and when he realized he couldn't control her, he killed her. The other theory that they presented was that Doan had killed Carrie to keep her from testifying against him in the upcoming court case. You know, the space heater to the head Mm -hmm. case. The defense, however, claimed there was no proof that Carrie was deceased 
and they even presented witnesses that claimed to have seen Carrie driving her red Honda CRX after her disappearance. Hmm. Now, just a couple of, of those things are, uh, there's three women that are uh, traveling together and they pick up a female hitchhiker on August 31st of 1996 in Mount Oreb, uh, which is about 20 miles from Blanchester. They all testified that the woman resembled the picture of Culberson that was televised that weekend. But uh, two of them also stated that the hitchhiker never mentioned Blanchester. This same hitchhiker supposedly bought a soft drink at a store um, the same day, but the store clerk couldn't uh, remember basically what the, the young woman looked like. Uh, another woman spotted a red Honda CRX uh, a week after Carrie had disappeared and seen the license plate and thought the license plate was uh, started ROL4, which uh, Carrie's license plates on her Honda was ROL402. So hmm. she, you know, she admitted, however, that she had poor vision. And uh, when she was following the car, hoping it was Carrie, she never caught up to it. Hmm. And then there's Kenneth Lancaster, who was a police officer from Norwood, Ohio, who reported seeing a small red car speed by him about 4.30 in the morning on May 16th, 1997. Now, he, he says he only got a quick glance of the vehicle because it was traveling at a you know such a high rate of speed. And after a 30 or 40-minute search, he couldn't find the car. Hmm. But when Lancaster reported the vehicle to the police dispatcher, he wasn't sure about the license plate, so he gave them two different um, license plate numbers. One of them was ROL402. The other was RQL402. Hmm. But by the time of the trial, you know, Lancaster had decided he probably had made a mistake uh, and he couldn't even identify the model of the car or, or he never got an eye of the occupants. So mm -hmm. right. he basically recanted. But that's what the defense is going on is they're saying... He didn't kill her. Look, these people are seeing her. Not a lot of people bought that. Jury deliberations began on August 4th of 1997. And on August 7th, 1997, the jury found Doan guilty of one count of aggravated murder and three counts of kidnapping, determining that Doan kidnapped or tried to kidnap Culberson and she died as a result. Vincent Doan was sentenced to life without parole for the murder and nine years for the kidnapping. Several appeals have been made by Doan and his defense attorneys, but all have been denied. Good. As for the others involved, Richard Payton, remember the police chief? Mm hmm. He was released from his duty as police chief in Blanchester and was accused of assisting the Doan family cover-up uh, with the murder scene in 1996. Oh, I agree with that. He was charged with obstruction of justice, but pled guilty to two counts of dereliction of duty, receiving a year's unsupervised probation, a $700, $750, I'm sorry. Wow. Fine. And a 90-day suspended jail sentence. So he got a $750 ticket. That's, well, really, that's really all. They should have made him do the jail time. Yeah, no doubt. That'll learn him. That'll learn him, huh? Yeah. Tracy Baker was found guilty of obstruction of justice in Culberson's murder case and sentenced to eight years in prison. Dang. He was paroled in 2005. So that that was the stepbrother. Yeah, That right. helped him. Yep. Helped him supposedly. Cover it up or whatever, yeah. He got eight years. The sheriff that helped cover it up got seven hundred fifty seven hundred fifty dollar <laughs> ticket. Go figure. Lawrence Baker, Doan's father, was tried but was acquitted. So the father didn't get anything because I mean, the 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 father basically came up with a couple different things. You know, he well he called me and told me that he'd run out of gas and uh, uh, that's what he was calling for at one o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and then it was. Uh, 
me and his mom went over to his house to check, make sure he got home from that, and he was asleep on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what that's what they were trying him on. Like, dude, you're lying. Mm-hmm. But he, he didn't get anything. In 2001, the Culberson family won a $2 million wrongful death lawsuit against the city of Blanchester. Good. The city also pledged to establish a memorial to victims of domestic violence as a result, and a plaque of Kerry Culberson was put in the lobby of the Blanchester Police Department, where it is to remain until Culberson's remains are found. Hmm. Wow. Their memorial to... uh, the victims of domestic violence is like a it's a statue of, of this girl or lady that's running on these rocks mm-hmm. and these rocks have different things written on them like mm-hmm. justice and it's pretty cool oh pretty nice thing. but yeah hey we'll put up a more memorial because uh, our crappy police work yeah. is the reason we never yeah, found did a terrible daughter. job yep Vincent Doan is currently incarcerated at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility, which is a maximum security prison in Lucasville. Ooh, I've heard about that one. It's also where they execute people at. Sure is. It is. Mm -hmm. I wonder when the last time they executed someone. Oh, it wasn't too long ago, was it? No. I mean, I think it's been a few years. Three, four years. I think it's about time we fire it back up. (laughs) Let's do it. To this day, Carrie Culberson's remains, nor her Honda CRX, have been found. Which I think is odd, because they've never found her car. Yeah, well, they obviously dumped it in a pond, or... Um, what was that one story on Netflix where they took it to a junkyard, right? Oh, uh, Making making a Murderer with yeah. Stephen Avery. Yep. Yeah, they, his family owned the junkyard, and they found her mm-hmm. car. That's a different story. I have, I have mixed feelings on that one. But uh, anyone with additional information or questions regarding this case should contact Clinton County Sheriff's Office at area code 937-382-1611. Yep. How about that? Yep. I'd like to know where her her remains are. Oh, yeah. I mean, say she was in that pond. Uh, Number one, they took took the... uh, the garbage bags. Yeah. Like, was she dismembered? But mm. how do you dismember her with a gun? Well, that, a that's smoke? why I was confused too. Yeah. Well, wasn't she back to, or no, that she wasn't, I guess not. But still, I mean, you took, okay. Say you take, you take these, uh, these garbage bags. We don't know whether she's dismembered or not. Mm-hmm. Either way, let's say, let's go off the theory that they throw her in this pond which is a stupid idea to throw a dead body in a pond that your family owns. Right, oh, right, right. But when footprints are all around it the next day, after they're searching for evidence, and that's a little odd. Oh, yeah. Yep. But let's say, let's let's go with, okay, they threw her in this pond, and then they took her out, whether she was whole or whether she was in pieces. Mm-hmm. They took her out. She still has to be somewhere. Yeah. You think that this piece of trash, you know, Buddy, you're in prison for the rest of your life. Come clean. Yeah. Where's she at? He thinks there's still a chance to get out. Not a, not a chance. Not a chance. But then again, where's the car? Right, right. Let's find the car. I bet somebody bought a hatchback Honda in 1997. Yep. Like, oh, this is a nice car. Thanks, Vincent Don't. Mm-hmm. Here's a pack of Marlboros for your trouble. <laughs> So, ladies, moral of the story, if your man likes Dale Earnhardt, Marlboros, and Boosh Light, Boosh, you better leave. Boosh. If, they like, if he likes the old George W., you better leave. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. <laughs> Special. So no one likes our show anymore. No. Nope. Thanks, Dustin. <laughs> All right. Now, I, I'm telling you, though, I just picture this... this Dude smelling like B.O. <laughs> Sitting in his trailer on a couch that's got like cigarette burns all over it. Uh-huh. Like, give me a beer, Carrie. Wearing a white t-shirt with uh, sweat rings under yeah. the arms. <laughs> <laughs> got his Wranglers on and old dusty cheap cowboy boots. <laughs> I told you. 
not to bring me any more than bush light. <laughs> <laughs> natty light now. I'm a natty light fan. Natty light. Oh, my. I only drink Budweiser because of Dale Jr. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough of this. Yeah. Let's go visit him. <laughs> Let's do it's it. not far from us. No, no. No, not too far. A couple hours. Let's let's act like we're really gonna we're really there for something important, and they bring him in the room. And we'll just roast him. Let's like roast do him. it. That's why Dale Junior sucks. <laughs> Dude, they said uh, there is a story that uh, you know while he's in prison, um, he was originally at the Queensgate Correctional Facility uh, around November of 1996. While all this was going on for for a traffic charge before he was locked up for the murder, so. While he's locked up for this traffic charge, uh, an inmate that was uh, with him in a cell testified that the two of them had talked about girlfriends. And Doan told him, uh, you can't let them walk. You got to make them pay. And then Mm -hmm. uh, Doan told Epperson that, um, talking about Carrie, that he would lie awake at night and think of a hundred different ways to kill her before I did. Wow, that dude is crazy. He is. But they say that there's stories of this dude in jail. Like, some dude was like, I served time with him for like six years, and I saw him picking butts out of out of uh, the trash can in front of the cafeteria. He's a bum. <laughs> what? That dude's a bum. <laughs> wow. So I might have I might have a point here when I'm like, yeah, I see him sitting there stanking, uh, <laughs> just smoking his <laughs> cigarette butts. <laughs> hey man, let me get that butt. <laughs> Both ways. <laughs> I'll trade you butt for butt. <laughs> oh man! But that is the story of the murder of Carrie Culberson. Again, if you have any information that could help us find her remains, contact Clinton County Sheriff's Office at nine three seven three eight two one six one one. Good story, buddy. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm. I do. Give me, give it to me, Rex. Well, if you haven't yet, get onto our Facebook page. Give us a like. If you have any uh, comments, ideas, you can email us at eviltransgression at gmail.com. Dustin? You can become a Patreon member if you join. Or a patron. I haven't got there yet. Oh, okay. If you join patreon.com slash eviltransgression, or you can go to Podbean, click on the Become a Patron, and... We have a three and a five dollar tier, so get early access to the shows. I don't like you having to do all that typing. I like you just to, if you're on Podbean, click it, click that button. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not on Podbean, go to the episode <laughs> description. Pow! No, now we're pow, pow, pow. Click that uh, the link that says our links. Pow! Click it, and then go to the link that says our Patreon. Click it. Boom. <laughs> That's how you do it. Well, you couldn't type nothing. Are you guys done? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Man, man. Well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening, Evil Mob. And until next week, see ya. See ya. Peace. <laughs>